likely to have been to have been uh, selected to present the first uh, seminar in this series of, of tea time. A little bit. Okay. So measuring behavior, what are we measuring? We are measuring individual differences in behavior. Why does one animal behave differently from another animal? And as we all know, in the last years, it has become more and more evident that the biggest problem we have in this field is the replication of findings. People report uh, behaviors in mutants, in strains, and then other people try to replicate that and find something completely different. And it does not necessarily mean that one of them is not doing their job well. It's not a new problem. About almost 25 years ago, uh, there was this article in Science by John Crabb, Doug Walson, and Bruce Dudek. And I assume that actually basically everybody of you is more or less familiar with this article. They standardized everything possible between the different labs. Uh, the same food, tap water, which might have been a difference, things like that. Um, the, the behavioral testing apparatuses were made by the same workshop and shipped to the three different labs. Uh, the animals were all ordered from the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, they, uh, they, they even standardized things like when animals were mated, they were all mated at the same time. And nevertheless, they found huge differences between the different labs. Uh, one of the most spectacular one was the one knockout that they used in their study, and which in one lab was more anxious than the controls. In another lab, there was no difference. And in the third lab, the controls were more anxious than the mutants. So you could choose whatever result you wanted to have by choosing the lab where it was done. Uh, one thing should be noted though, and that's that a lot of behaviors that they measured uh, did replicate between, uh, between laboratories. People just concentrated on those that didn't replicate, but a lot of it replicated. And, those that replicated were mostly uh, the kind of behaviors that, that were reinforced, like learning behaviors uh, or alcohol drinking, stuff like that. It was um, behaviors like plus maze behavior, anxiety and plus maze that, that um, did not replicate. So what are the kind of things that we measure? Well, we, we are interested in all kinds of behaviors, such as learning. We want to know things about anxiety, uh, depression, hyperactivity, all kinds of things like that. And that's what we measure, isn't it? No, wrong. That is not measured. What we measure is for learning, for instance, the number of correct responses for anxiety, time on an open arm um, and so forth. Those are the, that we that we measure. Rest that is learning or anxiety is an inference that we do by interpreting the results, and that is a very crucial thing to know. We infer learning from the number of correct responses, uh, but an animal may be feeling not well that day or have a headache and is performing not very well because of that. Doesn't mean doesn't he can't learn. A very human thing to do too is that we tend to confound measurements with the underlying psychological construct. That's why we say we measured learning or we looked at anxiety in these mice and tested the anxiety. No, we didn't test the anxiety, we tested the plus mice. So when we study animal behavior, there are different pitfalls. And it starts with the interpretation of the results from the side of the experimenter, projection, often leading to anthropomorphization. It's, it's a very basic human uh, thing to project 
uh, things upon others to assign them motivations that resemble your own motivations because that, that is your motivation. That's what you think others will be motivated by too. By too. I went into science because I wanted to have some patents and become filthily rich. Didn't work. Um, but then I started interpreting everything that other people do in the same way that they try to become filthily rich. That's projection. And that often leads to anthropomorphization that we assign drives uh, to animals and emotions to animals that are human and that are perhaps completely foreign to the animal itself. Reification, that is something you see very, very often in behavioral research. Um, what is this? Um, it, it, it's, a, again, a very human process where we um, think of something and that something that we are thinking of becomes a real thing. Let me give you an example because this sounds a bit muddied. Um, suppose you go into the animal facility, you take a cage and there's a mouse in there, the resident. You take another mouse from another cage and you put that with that resident in his cage. And what you will often see then is that after uh, a few sniffings, the resident attacks the intruder. And so you see that and you say, wow, that, that, that animal is aggressive. Um, you put them back and you go away. The next day you come into the animal facility again, this time with your graduate student, and you decide to show your graduate student this fighting behavior. You take the resident, you put the intruder in, and the resident attacks the intruder. And the student asks you, Professor, why is this mouse attacking? And you say the mouse is attacking because it's aggressive. Now, I hope you see the circle redenation here. We call the mouse aggressive because it attacked. And then we explain the fact that the mouse attacks by saying he is aggressive. We haven't explained anything. We don't know anything yet. We just know that this animal attacks. That's the behavior he shows. Why he attacks, whether it's aggression or not, is something completely different. Um, well, there's the mice themselves. First of all, they are much smarter than we are because if you have ever done learning tests with mice, they very often find ways of solving the problem that you didn't think of yourself to start with. At least that happened to me several times. And mice don't read our papers. That, that, that's a bit of a flippant statement, but it's a very important statement. Uh, mice don't read our papers even though they're so smart. Um, what do I mean with that? I mean with that, that we design tests and say, okay, this is a plus maze. This is measuring anxiety because animals put an elevated spot are vulnerable for predation. And so animals that don't go there are anxious that stay in the, in the enclosed arms. Um, that's all very well to, to think about, but mice don't know that we wrote that article and said this. They may have their own drives, their own motivations. And one of the problems is that we measure very few variables in, in there's a second test here, the, uh, uh, the elevated O maze, zero maze. Um, it's the same principle and the same variables are being measured. The, the percentage of time passed in the open arms or the open uh, parts of the, of the zero maze. Uh, perhaps frequency of entries. Um, if you're lucky, people might even look at head dips, but then you're at three variables, four variables, it's very little. And that makes it very, easy to fall into the trap of thinking in a single dimension. Uh, that the extremes of behavior you see in this plus maze or in the zero maze are the extremes from very anxious to very little anxious. And nothing else is happening there, perhaps. That is what you start to think. 
and you would be wrong. Um, one indication already that something else may be going on is that these tests are supposed to work only for naive animals. Once you have put animals in a zero maze or in a plus maze, uh, you're not supposed to repeat that because it's pharmacologically different. But think about uh, the innate fear of elevated open spaces. Um, why should that be only for the first five minutes that the animal is on that maze? Why not the next day if you put them another five minutes on the, on the plus maze or the zero maze? Why is that completely different? Um, reification here is an issue because that's what people say. Um, they say it's different. You, well, no, we see it's different, but what is different, we don't know. Another example here, the tail suspension dorsal tests. So most of you are with these tests. It's tests to, that are supposed to measure behavioral despair. In both tests, animals are put into a situation that's mildly difficult. Uh, they don't like to be in a bigger glass of water that they can't escape from. And they don't like hanging upside down by their tail either. Um, and tests, we measured the exact same behavioral phenotypes, namely the time that animals are immobile, because at some point they give up, they show what we then call behavioral despair. And um, the other measure that we take and see to the first bout of, of, of immobility. So there's two variables. Again, you can only have one dimension there, highly immobile or not immobile at all. Um, is that really the only thing that's going on there? Well, if it is, if those two tests both measure the same underlying process, then if we uh, do the experiment, you should find that both tests measure the same thing. And we did that. These are data from an experiment that we did years ago uh, in which we looked at unpredictable chronic mild stress as a model for depression. So the black bars are animals that were stressed. The white bars are the controls, animals that were not stressed. Uh, we did three different inbred strains, C57 black six, PELP-C, DBA2, and we had males and females. And without going into detail, you can already see that the left panel looks very different from the right panel. There are some stars indicating significant differences, which are not at the same places. Uh, if you look at the results of the ANOVA at the bottom of the screen, um, you see that for the portal test, there are sex and treatment effects, which don't pop up in the tail suspension test. Um, DBA2s, Females in the porcel test show a huge effect of the higher the bar, the more immobile and the more depressed the animals are supposed to be. But if you look at them in the suspension test, there's hardly any difference between the one and, and it's not significant at all. Even worse, if you look at the B6 males, um, the porcel test, males, B6 males that have been stressed are much more immobile than controls. Significant effect. If you go to the tail suspension, test, the males, the, the control males are much more immobile than the stressed males. So again, here you can have basically any result, result that you want to have by carefully choosing which sex, which strain that you're gonna test. But more importantly, what it measures, what it shows is that these two tests apparently clearly do not think mice didn't read our articles. So the question for to answer what we are measuring is that we urgently need to cross-validate our behavioral tests. We have to validate them, cross-validate them. And some people will say, well, PLOS has been validated uh, years ago. 
Well, if you look at that, um, what was done is a compound was taken, benzodiazepines, which are known in humans to reduce anxiety. And they were used in the plus maze. And if you're lucky, you will find that same effect in the plus maze. So that was reported. And therefore, people say, well, it, it was pharmacologically validated. Unfortunately, not all compounds that are known to be anxiolytic in humans have the expected effect in the plus maze. And again, it depends a lot on the sex and the uh, strain of the animals that you, uh, that you are using. Let me give you some examples of validation of tests. This is work from David Wolfer and Hans-Peter Lee. I don't know about Hans-Peter, but I saw David early in the audience. Um, this is not some trivial experiment. They did, if I remember correctly, 1,400 animals here. So this is quite something. Um, you are all familiar with the uh, water maze navigation test. It's, it's not really a maze, of course, because it's, it's just an open pool. Um, animals have to find a hidden platform in order to escape the water. The motivation being that they don't like to be in the water. Um, you see down here representations of, of a mouse and um, the different trials on different days. You see that in the beginning, they swim around a lot until at some point they find the platform and have learned where the platform is and go there pretty much immediately as soon as you put them into the water. Again, most people measure only very few, very few behavioral variables like um, escape fit latency, which is the, the most used variable. It's not a very good variable. There's a lot of confound in there, but, but for instance, uh, swimming speed. Um, so if you're lucky, people also will look at pod length. Uh, but that's about it. Pod length, escape latency, and there you go. This is a learning test, right? Uh, in science, it, it, it was announced at some point as the gold standard of learning. Well, this is what and Deep found. They tested 1,400 mice, but they looked at many more variables than just those two that I just mentioned. And then they did a factor analysis on it. Factor analysis is, is a mathematical statistical technique where you look at correlations between variables and try to separate them in, into underlying factors that explain the variation between uh, your mice. And the first factor, which explains about half of all variation, half of all variation between individuals, it's the factor tigmotaxis, the tendency, the natural tendency that mice have to stay close to a wall if they are in an enclosure, whether there's water in there or an open field, you see the same thing in the open field. Um, mice don't like to walk in the middle of, of an open surface or swim in the middle of an open surface, which is kind of logical if they're close to the wall, uh, they are more shielded from predation from predators than if they are in the middle of the water. But then as you see in this diagram, if mice swim close to the wall all the time, they will not really find the platform. 50%. Second factor, passivity, the tendency of some mice just to hang in the water and wait until the experimental takes them out. Don't say these animals didn't learn anything. They learned that if they just are patient, they will get out of the water. They're not going to drown. 20%. We're now at 70% explained. And then finally, factor three, which explains the memory aspect of the test. And that's the full 13%. Now, it doesn't mean that this is not a test that you can't use. It, it's a very valuable test because if something is wrong with your mouse, you're going to see it. 
they will be different from the control group. However, it is too short to say this is a memory deficit or a memory improvement, whatever way the effect goes. Um, you will have to look into more detail at your animals before you can decide that you have found a memory effect in the Morris maze. Radial maze, it's a maze that I myself have done a lot of work with together with Hans Peter Lip and uh, her, her, above all Herbert Schweig from Magdeburg. Um, these, these are some photos that I pulled off the internet. Let's start with the one on the left. Um, it has lots of arms. That's fine. That, that, that's not really a problem. The mice can look around in the environment to orient themselves in space. It's, it's supposed to be a spatial learning task after all. But then look at the arms themselves. They are exactly like the open arms on an elevated plus space. I predict two groups of animals have exactly the same learning capabilities, but they differ in levels of anxiety, that you're going to find a performance difference on this particular radial maze, whatever test you're, you're going to with learning them. Uh, just because this will induce a lot of anxiety in the animals that you're testing. The other two mazes, let's not go into too much detail, but the other two mazes, uh, remember, these are my testing. It's supposed to be spatial. How are they? How on earth are they going to be able to orient themselves if the arms are opaque? They're not Superman. They cannot have X-ray vision and, and look through those those walls. This is the radial maze as we used it uh, in my lab. Um, the arms are clear plexiglass. Of, the maze stands on the floor, so there's no elevation-induced anxiety. Um, plexiglass, so they can see the environment. It's enclosed, of course. There, there, there's a cover. You don't see this on this photograph. Uh, but the, the uh, arms are enclosed, so the mouse cannot escape. Um, some of the strains that we used in our experiments um, see very well, uh, they have visual problems. Uh, albino mice have problems. Some animals have retinal degeneration. Um, so we made it visually as easy, easy as possible. It's a, a spatial orientation test, not a visual acuity test. So we put objects close to the arms. Then at the end of each arm, there's a little enclosure um, and in there is fresh food, fresh food pellets, so that each arm smells like fresh food. So an animal that's here may smell the presence or absence of uh, a reward. And it shouldn't be able to see that either. So that's why we have this little uh, barrier and the food reward. This is a pretty big one, actually. Usually we use something small. Uh, is hidden behind that barrier. So here is a smart mouse that found the food reward, and here we have a happy mouse that ate the food reward. So let's now look at cross-validation between different tests. Uh, there's a problem because you often cannot retest the same individuals. Uh, an animal that has been tested in a radial maze to find eight hidden uh, food rewards in an eight arm radial maze, um, there, there will be interference if you put the same animal later than again in the radial base, but now do a different learning test. So it's, it's not that good to use the same individuals. Also there's processes of habituation and you run into problems like which test you do first and, and which test next, because that might interfere again with each other. So it's not that easy. Um, the solution is to use replicated individuals and replicated individuals, as we all know, that's inbred strains. Because then you can use the strain as your point of measurement and test different individuals from the same strains and then correlate 
um, the strain means. Here is one example of that. This is uh, two radial maze tests in an eight arm radial maze. In one test, the eight arms uh, were uh, all eight baited. In the other one, only four were baited and the animals had to remember which ones were baited and which ones were not baited. And each dot here is an inbred strain. And as you see, there is a pretty strong correlation, 0.9 between the two strains, indicating that the same learning capabilities are being used by the mice in order to solve, uh, to solve the, the uh, maze test. We did quite a lot of different experiments in the, uh, in the radial maze, almost in the same phase like I just showed you. A few were different. Um, let me see. So here is spatial eight arms. That's the test as I just described to you. Eight arms. Each arm has a food reward. Um, unconfined eight arm that the animals can freely run through the maze, but whichever way they, want, they go to the center form and then they choose an arm. What happens in a situation like that is that you often get a chaining reaction where animals go clockwise or counterclockwise from one arm to the other. It's, it's a very efficient strategy, of course, uh, but it's not necessarily a spatial strategy. It could be, but it, not necessarily. Um, so that's why we did the other test uh, where also all eight arms were baited, but where we um, confined the animals to the central platform for five seconds and that cuts off, interrupts this chaining strategy of going one arm to the other. Um, let's see, um, there is, a, oh here, the last one at the bottom, non-spatial eight arms. Um, that is where there was a barrier at from the center platform to the entrance of the arm, which the animals could push open. And after that, it would stay open. So here they had to learn if the, um, if the barrier is still up, that arm contains a food reward. If it's down, the food reward is eaten. Um, and then there are these tests indicated with RM and WM, short for reference memory, working memory, um, where we did a spatial test, meaning that they had to orient themselves using extra maze cues. We turned the maze in between uh, trials so that tiny differences between arms that perhaps we can't see, but they can see or smell. Um, didn't help the animals with finding the food rewards because the food rewards were um, always at the same space in the testing room, but not necessarily the same physical arm, if you understand what I'm going to. Um, this is the total number of errors in those spatial tests. It goes with the spatial aid arms, which is on the previous slide, what I showed you. Uh, that there's a correlation, you see that. So uh, then there was a non-spatial test where we had uh, inserts on the floor of different black and white patterns. Uh, in one test, they were always in the same configuration, black balls next to white stripes, etc. cetera. Um, in another version of the test, we changed them. They were all the time in different positions. Every trial was different. And to make a long story short, if you do a factor analysis on the results of all these tests, what you find is three different factors. It's not just spatial, non-spatial. There is one factor here for spatial learning, but non-spatial learning doesn't seem to be a unitary thing because we have two variables, uh, uh, sorry, factors. We have two factors with loadings by variables from tests that are non-spatial. So things are a little bit more complicated than just spatial, non-spatial. A final example. Uh, this is a, an own field test. 
um, a number of strains and hybrids were tested. We looked at genetic correlations here. And again, an open field is very often used as a test of anxiety, uh, where people interpret low levels of activity as an animal being anxious or an animal that shows a lot of, of, of um, uh, behavior staying close to the wall. Um, that, that is then being interpreted as anxiety and it might very well be. But if those that you have distance run and uh, how much time in the periphery uh, close to the wall, how much time in the center, um, that basically, again, you're, you're looking at a unidimensional uh, thing because you can't see more tensions if you only have two, two or perhaps three variables. Um, when you look at more variables and like Fotola at the beginning in his introduction said, uh, the behaviors that Van Abelen defined in the uh, etogram of the mouse that he published in 1963. If you look at those different behaviors, leaning against the wall, rearing, which is different, most people, if they even if they look at it, most people don't look at it. Let, let, let's put it that way. But those people that look at it often throw these together, leaning and rearing, as vertical activity. It's not the same thing. Leaning is leaning against the wall. The animal is close to the wall. Rearing is with the four paws free and it's standing on its hind legs, reconnoitering the environment. Um, and, and as you see in this factor analysis, leaning is different from rearing, which loads on two different factors. Um, here, the first factor looks like it is something that we could call exploratory behavior. It's behaviors that allow an animal to explore their environment. Um, it has negative relation with defecation, defecation which is often taken as a, as a measure of emotionality or anxiety. Um, then there's the second factor, which is kind of like a, a self-maintenance factor, mostly defined by grooming uh, activity. And then there's the third factor, uh, which has a high positive loading of defecation. And that might be um, fear or anxiety. Note that rearing loads on two of these factors, rearing loads on the first factor, exploration positively. It, it's a variable that, uh, a behavior that allows an animal to collect a lot of information about its environment. Uh, however, because it's away from the wall in the open, putting yourself on your hind legs in the open makes you very visible for predators. So it's also a very dangerous behavior. And not surprisingly, it loads negatively on the anxiety factor. So again, one test, but uh, at least three different uh, behavioral mechanisms underlying the behavior that we're looking at. And only if you look in detail, can you see that. So what do we measure? Well, let's be honest about it. Most of the time we have no clue. Um, we have all kinds of ideas and in our grant applications, we say happily that we're gonna test anxiety in the animals by using a plus maze. And because the reviewers are in on the conspiracy, they will not pose any problem there. They will not say, well, you don't know it, whether it measures anxiety. So everybody can be happy. But I'd like to be a little bit more happy than that. What is need? Um, we need to validate tests like we did with the open field, like we did with the radial maze. We need cross-validation of tests. Why do we get different results in tail suspension 
um, personal tests. We have to know what the underlying behavioral variables are, behavioral processes are that cause these tests to give different results. To, in order to be able to do that, we need to measure multiple variables. Done with just a simple one or two variables in test, it doesn't tell you enough. We need to use our knowledge of animal behavior to, to, to think of variables that we can measure and that can help us in elucidating what actually is going on in the heads of our little mice. And this, of course, requires that we abandon our simplistic one-dimensional thinking and start thinking in multiple dimensions of behavior. Um, well, I, with that, I would like to end by showing you the people that did all the work that I showed you. Um, Jan Mineur in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, Catherine Belzum, who collaborated on the chronic mild stress experiments, Herbert Schwegler, who was a very important person in my career early on when I did my postdoc. And let's see, Franz Sluiter with somebody with whom I collaborated a lot. We had a lot of papers together. And last but not least, Hans-Peter Lipp and David Wolfe, uh, who taught me more than they probably know themselves. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and sorry again for the problems earlier on. I, I think I should retire that laptop. It's at the end of its life. And I'm available now for questions.